invite you to light your chalice with us this morning with these words from Steve Stock. We light this chalice to celebrate the inherent worth and dignity of every person, to reaffirm the historic pledge of liberal religion, to seek that justice which transcends mere legality and moves toward the resolution of true equality, and to share that love which is ultimately beyond even our cherished reason, that love which unites us. As is our tradition, we also light a candle in solidarity with those families separated at our southern border. I would like to invite you to join us in our opening hymn, hymn number 1023 in the Teal Hymnal, Building Bridges. The words will be shared on screen. One of the ways that we proclaim the warmth and caring of our community is by sharing our joys, concerns, and milestones. We invite those who wish to use the Zoom chat box to type your joy, concern, or milestone during the music for meditation. If you wish for your joy or concern to be acknowledged but don't want to share it, you may also type that you have an unspoken joy or concern. Thank you to all who shared their joys, concerns, and milestones this morning. May all the joys, concerns, and milestones of this community, those shared aloud and those held in silence, be received into the care and concern of all present. Please join me in the spirit of meditation in whatever way feels right with these words from Betty Jo Middleton. As we gather here together, may we be attentive to one another. May we listen carefully 
may we freely speak. May we be respectful of one another. May we be serious yet not somber. May we be light of heart and full of good cheer as we gather here together. May we work towards common goals. May we be mindful of our religious community and aware of our responsibilities. May we look into one another's eyes and see ourselves reflected. As we gather here together, may we be attentive to one another and to the task at hand. Blessed be. The offering that we take each Sunday isn't just a stale habit. It's an opportunity to recommit to this place and to this people. Our offering is an affirmation, a yes. When we give, we say yes to something we value. With our gifts freely given, may we say yes to the values of our faith. May our offering help us practice Unitarian Universalism within and beyond our congregation as tools to empower our mission. To make a donation online via PayPal, please visit auuf.org donate. If you are writing a check, please make your check payable to AUUF with a note on the memo line about whether it is for the offering or your pledge and mail it to P.O. Box 669, Auburn, Alabama, 36831. The offering will now be gratefully received. from Colleen Hoover. I got schooled this year by everyone, by my little brother, by the Abbott brothers, by my mother, my best friend, my teacher, my father, and by a boy 
a boy that I'm seriously, deeply, madly, incredibly, and undeniably in love with. I got so schooled this year by a nine-year-old. He taught me that it's okay to live life a little backwards and how to laugh at what you would think is unlaughable. I got schooled this year by a band. They taught me how to find that feeling of feeling again. They taught me how to decide what to be and go be it. I got schooled this year by a cancer patient. She taught me so much. She's still teaching me so much. She taught me to question, to never regret. She taught me to push my boundaries because that's what they're there for. She told me to find a balance between head and heart, and then she taught me how. I got schooled this year by a foster kid. She taught me to respect the hand that I was dealt and to be grateful I was even dealt a hand. She taught me that family doesn't have to be blood. Sometimes your family are your friends. I got schooled this year by my teacher. He taught me that the points are not the point. The point is poetry. I got schooled this year by my father. He taught me that heroes aren't always invincible and that the magic is within me. I got schooled this year by a boy, a boy that I'm seriously, deeply, madly, incredibly, and undeniably in love with. And he taught me the most important thing of all, to put the emphasis on life. As a black Baptist minister, like so many others of his time, Joseph Jordan was prone to preaching a message of hellfire and brimstone to his Norfolk, Virginia congregation. What was unusual though for a post-Civil War minister like himself is that Jordan openly preached that God was going to punish white people who oppressed black people for all eternity. In the late 19th century, slavery had been abolished, but systematic inequality remained, with Jordan and so many others being unable to find adequate housing, jobs, and education. Indeed, in the Reconstructionist era South, Systemic racism was the norm, and there were very few long-term prospects to the point that many people went to work for the very same slaveholders they had just been freed from. In a way, it's understandable that Jordan's anger about inequality would lead him to wish for divine vengeance on the part of the downtrodden who had suffered so much already. But then something happened. A friend gave Jordan a copy of a book called The Plain Guide to Universalism, which was a popular universalist primer of the time. He devoured the message inside, reminded that the God he believed in was not just a God of vengeance, but one of mercy, love, and forgiveness as well. Though it had to have been a hard pill to swallow, Jordan couldn't avoid the fact that there is more about loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you than there was about divine retribution, at least in the Christian scriptures. He came to realize that his sermons of damnation and vengeance didn't represent the gospel he believed. His ministry to that point had been a mistake, it seemed. So Joseph Jordan stopped preaching his fiery, judgmental sermons. Instead of preaching damnation, he started preaching universalism, that everyone would eventually make it to heaven, and none were so terrible that they could not be reconciled to the eternal love of the universe. With a desire to learn more about the Universalist faith, Jordan traveled to Philadelphia, where he studied with Edwin C. Swester, minister of the Universalist Church of the Messiah. 
He remained there for seven months, during which time he was treated as a person instead of a thing by white people for the first time in his life, as a fellow child of God in their theology, as someone worthy of respect. After his study, a seven-member ordaining council unanimously voted to ordain Jordan, noting that he had a clear and bright mind, something that you hardly heard said about black folks back then, especially by white folks. And in 1889, Jordan became the first ordained black minister of the Universalist faith. Jordan returned to Norfolk, where he opened the first Universalist Church of Norfolk in a rented room, even building the pulpit himself, he was so dedicated. And the congregation quickly grew. From Jordan's original congregation, Universalism would soon spread all over Virginia. And in addition, with few other options available to them, Dozens of black school children came to Jordan's church for teaching. Throughout the week, Jordan taught the children to read, write, and do arithmetic, while on Sunday mornings, he preached a message that none are so ir evil as to be irredeemable. It's hard to quantify the impact that Joseph Jordan's ministry had on the world. What is clear, though, is that he was an angry man who wanted vengeance on those who had wronged him. But it turned out to be a message of love and respect, a message of the Universalists, that led him on an unexpected path away from hate and towards a different sort of ministry altogether, one that taught him that all could be reached and that love is the basis of all that we do. I have no doubt that he continued to believe that black folks deserve to be liberated, and he continued to believe that the actions of people who oppressed black folks were wrong, but he no longer believed that hate and vengeance were the answer. No doubt, countless folks were inspired by Jordan's ministry to reach out beyond the barriers they directed to protect themselves from the pain of living in a world that saw them as less than human. The message is powerful. By merely showing respect to someone, it's possible to lead, through example, a different way of being in the world, a way that's always available to us. Like the Philadelphia Universalists and then Jordan, we can, through the way we engage the world, show that one need not get stuck in the mire of fear and othering, but can move towards a way of being that sees every person in our world as deserving respect, as a beautiful person with sacred spark, who merely by being on this planet has inherent worth and dignity. As it changed Jordan, I am convinced that respect can change the world with every person we extend our consideration to. Now, I won't deny, it's interesting that I did the mercy and the respect sermons back to back because last week could be a hard pill to swallow. This week can be a hard pill to swallow too, especially in these often precarious and puzzled times. It can be hard to imagine extending consideration to people who behave in ways that are so often destructive to the larger cause of life. There are people, both historical and current, 
who I find it difficult to imagine how I could possibly respect. So the question naturally has to be asked, does respect have to be earned? And are some people more worthy of respect than others? The answers to these questions will depend on what we mean when we talk about someone being respectful. There is the sort of respect that is a deep regard for a person's ability and accomplishments. One that really respects what a person has done in their life. I always find this definition a bit precarious because if suddenly we lose our ability or our accomplishments seem start to fade away from the periphery, does that make us less worthy of respect? No, I, I think there's a deeper sort of respect here. Take Jordan, for example. He received the utmost in hospitality from the Universalists in Philadelphia, despite the racist norms of the time. Now, one could argue about whether he'd have been received as warmly if he hadn't been as, as smart or well-spoken as he was. But I see evidence here that he was simply seen as another human, worthy of the respect he received simply by virtue of the dignity each of us is born with. After the Philadelphians received Jordan, before they really knew a whole lot about him, they were showing him respect. Had he not been a suitable candidate for minister, they might not have ordained him, but I'm convinced that he still would have been treated kindly and even encouraged in his vocational aspirations. In this context, I'm referring to respect as due regard for the feelings, wishes, rights, or traditions of others. By this definition, respect isn't something we earn by being virtuous, but something that we extend to others because we recognize their worth and dignity, that part of them that is worthy of being protected just because they are human, like each and every one of us, each and every one of you. In this way, respect calls us to a different way of relating to one another. Imagine for just a moment we lived in a world where no one ever showed respect to anyone else, like in our story for all ages this morning. We go through life day to day without any expectation that others are going to treat us with dignity, with the belief that we'll constantly be taken advantage of where everyone interprets everyone else's words and actions in anything but the worst case scenario interpretation. I don't know about you, but it doesn't sound like a terribly nice place to me to live in. I know it would lead me to feeling cold and callous towards others. I'd probably also be more than a bit depressed and anxious always wondering when the next aggressive encounter is coming. I suspect I'd have trouble mustering up any motivation to do any good myself. And herein lies a lesson. A world without respect would be a world of alienation from each other. If respect towards one another is our recognition of our shared humanity, then lack of respect is a refusal to see each other as being interconnected, of not recognizing the ties we each have with one another. Humans are social animals. We need connection. And in such an alienated and sick world, we would never be our best. So it would be no surprise if a lot of people never 
acted their best. Depression and anxiety would be expected and normal reactions to a world that would seem oh so hostile to our mere existence. Respect isn't just a nice thing to think about. It reminds us that we all need each other and that there is nothing we can ever do to not be worthy of such consideration. This is a difficult task, especially for people who don't return the respect they're given. As I mentioned last week, it can be so easy to turn to an eye for an eye mentality, treating others as they treat us. However, in the words of Mahatma Gandhi, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. If we all lash out at one another, there will be not be any one left in the end who can see. <coughs> this is perhaps the most important reason to building a world full of respect. I am convinced that it is the only thing that will ever really change the trajectory of the world. Showing others through our words and deeds that they are worthy of a deep respect merely for being who they are is the only thing that's going to shift us out of a retributive mindset and into a stance that recognizes the complicated histories that each of us brings to the table. As author Sarah Deason once said, you should never be surprised when someone treats you with respect. You should expect it. Now this doesn't mean that respect calls us to let others walk all over us, or that we don't hold other people accountable for harmful, hurtful, and abusive behavior. It does mean that when we do so, we don't strip others of their humanity. Instead, we can choose to extend them a degree of civility that may not that they may not deserve for their actions, but that we are called to recognize by virtue of being alive. For so many of us who grew up in Western-oriented cultures, I'm not sure we got much of training in how to be respectful, or at least in the type of respect that I think has the power to change the world. After all, how many people as kids are told to show some family member or person some undue consideration when what the message really consists of is a command to let the other person walk all over us? I know I did. Give your brother your toy. Quit tattling on the mean kid who's bullying you. I know Grandma yelled at you, but give her a hug anyway. There's a deep sense of conflation of respect with codependency or even toleration of abuse. This is not healthy, and I would argue it's even counterproductive since we're not respecting ourselves and our own needs. Given this, I want to suggest the no harm platinum rule as a guide. You may have heard of the platinum rule, do unto others as they would have you do unto them as a correction to the golden rule. <clears throat> because the golden rule often assumes we all need the exact same things as each other. It doesn't recognize the complexity of our needs. But what if someone wants you to do something that's deeply harmful to them, or worse, to you? That's why I want to suggest the no harm platinum rule here as a guide to being respectful. Do unto others as they would have you do unto them without doing harm to the earth and its creatures. 
What if every time we were interacting with someone, especially people who were getting on our last nerves, we could call forth the No Harm Platinum role as a guide to how we could ethically believe, behave towards others, showing the greatest amount of respect to people. Sometimes that would mean a complicated response, and sometimes it might mean walking away. But I am convinced that this is something we can all learn. We can all learn to be able to respond in ways that don't degrade the humanity of others. Because when we degrade the humanity of others, we degrade the humanity of ourself. Rosa Parks once said that every person must live their life as a model of others, for others. I am convinced that if we could find ways to show this sort of respect in our everyday lives, we could model the possibility of a different way of being, not just to the people who we're interacting with, whose hearts and minds may or may not be hardened, but more importantly, to the young impressionable minds in our lives. The longer I live, the more I'm convinced that the revolution won't be some great burst of energy that calls forth a new way of being overnight, but that it starts with each of us choosing to do things in a little bit different way until it just becomes so natural we can't even imagine it being different. Every one of us is a role model to somebody and we can each leave the power, we each have the power to leave a great legacy simply through the way we treat others, maybe especially those who don't deserve it. And who knows, maybe your simple act of kindness and decency will inspire someone like Joseph Jordan to change the entire message of their lives, to turn from a retributive punishment-based mindset to one of grace, mercy, and inherent worth and dignity. What beauty could we recognize in the hearts of every person if we learn to see the beauty in each of their eyes, the stains on their soul, and the stains on their soul as a result of years of lack of self-respect. Maybe we might just shift the world towards a more loving paradigm if we can only recognize the power that a sense of respect can instill in a person to fight for their best self against whatever the world throws at them. May it be so.
going to this congregation, I was called a miracle, which that's kind of a lot to live up to. I'm, um, I happen to be talented enough to play the piano to accompany you folks, and I've had the privilege and the honor of being the choir director for all these years. We have a song in our hymnal called, I know, a music reference, what a surprise. Um, from you I receive, to you I give. I have gotten so much more out of everything I have done here, contributed, given, than I can even explain. Love, respect, um, hugs, dismissal, forgiveness. The, the theme is, is an abundance of connections. And here's where we make our connections to one another. And the building is beautiful and old and we need to respect it and care for it. But the fellowship is us, you and me. And I know each of us has something we can contribute to this place, to one another. Everyone's got a different point of view and we can learn so much from one another. But like those of us who <clears throat> are getting older, which beats the alternative, we need a little more TLC, so we need to care for this building and have enough money to make the improvements that are needed. We also need to pay the minister, you know, we kind of want to keep the minister around. Child care, office help, piano tuning, oh yeah, and pay the choir director. So please contribute. Um, I don't remember what it was, it says something like vote early and often. Mm. So pledge early and often. And thanks again for the opportunity you've given me. I love you all. We love you. Thanks. I would like to invite you to join us in our closing hymn, hymn number 129 in the gray hymnal, Let Love Continue Long. The words will be shared on screen. <laughs> Join me in extinguishing our chalices. You will find the words on screen. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Please join us now for our sung benediction. Go forth into the world in peace, in peace. Be of good courage, hold fast that which is good. Go forth into the world in peace, in peace. Love all people rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Go in peace.
Our benediction is from Rebbe Nachman of Breslov. Let the good in me connect with the good in others until all the world is transformed through the compelling power of love. Amen. Blessed be and go in peace.